unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise the Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 18 verses. Let's begin from verses 10. The Bible says two men went into the temple to pray. Somebody said two men went into the temple to pray. Now the Bible says two men went into the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee and the other one was a what? A publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself and said, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as publicans. Are you seeing what I'm saying? These guys go to pray and one guy turns to God and says, God, I thank you because I'm not like other men. They are extortioners, they are unjust, they are adulterers, even as publicans. And the Bible says, I fast twice a week. I give my tithe of all that I possess. And the Bible says, and the publican, the Bible says, standing far off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, two men. And the next verse says, I tell you, this is Jesus saying, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be a best, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Somebody say, Amen. Now the Bible tells us that there were two men that all went in the what? In the presence of God. And when one stands before God, he starts mentioning his achievements. You see that brother in a blue shirt, the cousin brother and the auntie, they all feed by my hand. God, I also thank you because, eh, guy ties. I even gave first fruit, but now I look at myself and compare myself with Brother Simon. Simon hasn't even tithed for Simon now. <laughs> you see, I'm not even publican. I'm not religious. I'm not a Pharisee like those guys who are preaching a fake gospel. God, I thank you. You know, the guy is speaking all of these things, but this is the funny thing about this man. Everything that is a success for him is pointing to himself. I thank you because I, 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 I. He's thanking God for everything that he is except that he's not. You understand what I'm saying? There is no glory to God. There is no pointing to God. There is no attention to God. Everything is attending to me. You see, God, I thank you because I am not like the other men who are extortioners. I fast twice a week. I give my tithe. I, 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 I. And then there's another guy also who can't even look to heaven because when he puts a torch on himself, direct translation, boye kubamu torch. The Bible says when he puts a torch to himself, or when he looks at himself, he sees nothing good about himself. Besides, it is even ascribed in the scripture that he is a publican. The Bible says he tells God, be merciful to me as a sinner. And the Bible says that day that man went back righteous. The Bible didn't tell us what happens to the other fellow. But the Bible tells us about the fellow who goes back righteous. Now let me also submit this to you because some of you might be thinking I'm going a certain direction, which I'm not. I want you to note that both of these men were under one covenant, which was the law. And you and I know that by the law, no flesh shall be justified before God. So you can believe that if there was something for this guy boasting, was he a Pharisee? What was he? If there was anything for the Pharisee to bother, it still was not enough justification before God. It was a justification before man, but it was not a justification before God. For the Pharisee, it was a justification before the law, but it was not a justification before God. Somebody say amen. Now, when you look at these two men, both being in, in the same covenant, the publican, of course, had agreed in his spirit that he had sinned before God and he didn't deserve any mercy. But he pleaded for mercy. And there's another guy, on the other hand, who looks at everything good he has done, except that he compares himself with everybody else. 
Now, if you're talking of the Old Testament dispensation under the Mosaic law, okay, the Pharisee had something to boast over in the presence of God. Are you hearing me? In this story, one man was right and another man was wrong. In this story. Because of the dispensation of covenant. You understand? The guy who thought that because he does everything right was wrong in the sense that it's not what you do that takes you to heaven. Somebody say amen. It's not according to works. The Bible says that if it was according to works, Abraham had something to boast of in the flesh, but not before God. That is in Romans 4. If you're talking of things, works that take a man to heaven and justify a man before God, Abraham had as pertains to the flesh, he would have boasted over something. But the Bible says, but not before God. Because if you look at how God weighs sin, the Bible says, even if you look at somebody, a woman, you understand? And you lust over her. The Bible says you've committed what? Adultery. You've sinned. Just by looking. The Bible says that he that hates a brother murders them. Now some of you say, that guy deserves in hell. No, you see, you hate your brothers every day. Praise the Lord Jesus. But because of the deception or without the revelation of truth and the understanding of the sin principle, many people think that hating another is different from killing another. But the Bible says, whosoever hated his brother, the Bible says, he is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Can you believe it? That every time you hate someone, you have killed. You think about it. Somebody say amen. Say amen again. Every time you look at someone and then you become angry and then you hate them, you have literally killed. So yes, you might not be taken to police to answer criminal charges, but before God, you have nothing to boast over. Say amen. Now we have an issue with Abraham that the Bible says that if Abraham were justified by works, he has where off to glory, but not before God. What does that mean? There is nothing, simply nothing you can ever do to be justified before God. There is nothing you can ever do You're hearing me. Let me read for you something in Job. And I'm going to come back to that. Let me read uh, for you something in Job. Job chapter 9 verse 20. Job chapter 9 verse 20. The Bible says, if I justify myself. Somebody say, if I justify myself. My own mouth shall condemn me. Did you hear that? He says, if I stand in plague and say, now, you know it. You know I'm right about this. I'm right because of ABC. The moment you start justifying yourself, the Bible says your mouth condemns you. If you say that you are perfect, it shall also prove you perverse. You can't claim perfection in human ability. You, you get my point? You can't claim justification in your humanness. This is Job speaking. And I want you to quote this. This was before, way, way, way before people understood truth. Like we understand it now. But they knew that no man can justify himself. If you do, your very mouth condemns you. Why? Because you speak or say something that condemns you. It's the same thing with perfection. If you say, I am perfect, your mouth will prove you imperfect. It will prove you perverse. This is in the flesh. He's not talking about the spirit man. He's talking about the man of the flesh. And you know how many people claim that scripture? And in the spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. He's not talking about the spirit. He's talking about the fleshly. By the law, the Bible says, no flesh shall be justified. You can't be justified by the law. You can't. Now, there's this Pharisee who thinks that by fasting and paying tithes and not being an extortioner and being unjust and being all of these kinds of things, he thinks that he's better. He's even thanking God that he is. And many of us actually are very guilty of this. Very guilty. How many of you look down on others because you're not doing what they are doing? You hear, oh, this brother did this. And then you compare yourself and you say, but me, I don't do that thing. And you say, oh, when I go, I thank you. Carrie, how can somebody do that? You know? Oh, one time I was seated next to a lady. She says, God, eh. she was judging another lady for becoming pregnant before marriage, which is wrong. So she, she said, Apostle, me, I don't understand young girls. How could she conceive before marriage? Oh, I understand she's wrong. You understand what I'm saying? But this is the point where you're supposed to be feeling sorry for her. 
It's not the point where you're supposed to be feeling that you're better than the brother or sister who has fallen. Hello? And I said, but I, mean, I thank God that me I didn't. <laughs> I told her, you know that girl can get to heaven before you. What do you mean, apostle? <laughs> Somebody say amen. Because some people, the moment, and you've had extortioners, and just, how many times have you walked on the streets and then you compared yourself with the fallen brother? Who is in the church? And then you say, ah, na yonu mukama. <laughs> when I was in high school, one time I'll tell you a story I'll never forget. We used to have guys who like, eat, like, like reading so much. Eh? We used to call it burning. Like burning books. Eh? Burning books. You remember those things? So a guy would sit in class and read. So there was a group of about six guys who were in class and I was among them. We were doing, you, you know those like two days when eh, your neighbor is bringing exams. Those last two days and then pressure hits you. And then you think about your parents. <laughs> then you think about their money. Then you remember the success cards you have. We believe in you. You can't fail us. I tell you are clever. Then you look at a history book and it is this size. <laughs> then you're like, eh, Kali, this is eight months of reading but nothing... <laughs> Do I have a witness? Yeah. Now, this guy comes in the window. We, I think, had the one day to the exam. So the guy comes in the window. He comes, he looks at all of us. Then he looks at all of us. Then he looks at one guy. Then he says, Mwenamu some. Now, you're your guy in a war some Let me translate it. He said, all of you can read, I don't care. But there is that guy, he pointed on some guy and says, that one, even if he reads like how, I'll win him. And it is the guy won him. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyway, back to the point I was trying to give. Many times, and I tell you, many of us Christians are like that. We so much look down on people who have fallen. And we give the impression that we are better than them because... We are not or have not done as much as they've done. You're a Pharisee. Praise the Lord Jesus. That man was wrong. Now, we also have the opposite bunch, which in that dispensation was right because it realized that it required the mercy of God for him to receive righteousness. He required a justification by grace for him to be righteous. But you see, if you read the dispensation of the New Testament, where you and I are, both men are wrong in the New Testament. They were right in the old, but both men are wrong in the new. And I'm going to explain that. Much as in Luke 18, the Pharisee says that, I thank you because I pay tithes, I pay all these things. I'm not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, and an adult, an adulterer, slack guy like the other guys, so I thank you. And we can all see that it is wrong for him to look down on other men because he is better, or for him to seek a justification of himself. He is wrong on that regard, and I've proved that. But when we cross over into the New Testament dispensation, the second man becomes wrong too. In a certain way. And I'm going to explain that. I'm going to explain that. That man had no choice but to condemn himself. Because he was not matching up to the law. When he looked at the Ten Commandments, he had broken all of them. He was a publican. The worst of all manners and character. And intention and spirit and conviction. You get my point? And that's okay. But when you become born again, when you become born again, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, some of you cross over into this new life and you still hold guilt consciences of your past. Do you know how many people have been forgiven by Jesus Christ, but they have never forgiven themselves? A lady came to me and she told me, Apostle, I've been barren for four years. Since my marriage, I've been barren for four years. 
And so I bow my head to pray. And when I start to bow my head to pray, the Lord tells me she has a guilt conscience because she aborted. Are you hearing me? She aborted many years ago when she was still a teenager. In her 15, 16 years. I think she conceived and she realized she can't take this baby home so she removed it. God forbid. And because of that, this woman has never forgiven herself. And when she comes to me to pray for her womb, she thinks that she's simply barren because a certain demon of barrenness is seated on her. Yet the reason why she has failed to conceive in her spirit is because she has a guilt conscience. And as clear as that, the Lord told me, I forgive her. Tell her to forgive herself. I told her, the Lord tells me, forgive yourself. Can you believe she conceived? Just after a few minutes, she conceived. What was the problem with her? She held a guilt conscience. Some of you, even after forgiveness, you still go back to those lines. You understand what I'm saying? Ate married people. If somebody made a mistake 15 years ago, why do you bring it back every time? Okay, yes, she was a thief five years ago, but she changed. She has not stolen since five years ago. But every time you're sitting over dinner now, you remember how you stole? <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. Listen, where forgiveness is, there has to be forgetfulness. In the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. Certain things might never be the same. And I understand because some people need to heal. It's a process. You understand? You might hurt somebody and they might need some time to what? To heal. Yes, give them the time to heal. But even when you're healing, heal forgiving. Somebody say amen. Don't heal angry. Extend a hand of... You might not talk to him the way you used to, yes, but at least extend a hand of love in certain things. And allow God to heal you. But some of you, even up to now, you understand? Even up to how many years? Yeah? One time I was praying for a dear person. Her father did something to her when she was little. She has never forgiven him. Up to today, every male who comes her way is in trouble. Because every man looks like her father. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, then you start carrying stereotypes. Me, don't tell me, men. Hey, what are you going to marry women? Somebody have a subject. No, no, no. Have you tried all of them? Hey, don't tell me, man. Don't come on. You have not tried everybody. Not everybody is like the person who hurt you. Somebody say, man. Not everybody is as crazy as the person who hurt you. So stop stereotyping. Hey, God forgive us. The tombulira, tombulira basoga. Tombulira, tombulira baganda. Don't tell me about these people. Don't tell me about that people. Don't tell me about... You've not dated all of them. Unless you want to tell us. Some of you parents who sit down your children. And then you... It's like a, a last will confession. My daughter. Never marry. Emuchiga. And then you find a new creation. Yes, he's a mutiga, but he's a new creature. <laughs> then you turn away from divine purpose because he's a mutiga. Tell the neighbor, the one they're talking about didn't come. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. When we became born again, those things have to die in the name of Jesus. You're not supposed to marry because of tribe. Marry because of purpose. Does he speak in tongues? Does he know the word of the Holy Ghost? Can he articulate mystery? Can he break it down? Does he have results? That's it. And parents also, don't make your children's lives hard. In Christ there is neither Muhima. <laughs> Somebody
Somebody say amen. amen. Your daughter will marry Muhim and you will club her every day. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. We are free. Tell your neighbor we are free. In the name of Jesus. So one man, like in the Old Testament, he confessed his weakness and sin and received mercy. But in the New Testament, when you confess your sin, the Bible says he's faithful and just to what? To forgive us of all our sins and do what? And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the Bible says. He's faithful and just to forgive all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. But after you've been forgiven and cleansed, don't go back again. When st- things happen, you start to say, oh, I think this is not happening because I didn't do this. Do you know how many people, oh, do you know how many people have lost the joy of salvation because every time they think that they, they have to match a certain stage and status and a certain place to earn a certain grace. Grace is free. Oh, you know, I was praying and then somehow uh, the Lord was with me and then great things happened. But then in the middle, I did something like this. And then after doing it, now I feel that because I did this, the will of God containing my life is going to end. And then you start a very sad, sober line of living where you're pointing on that Kawan witness which you did last week. And then you say, Mukama, because of that Kawan, your grace, your grace is in Mukama. E, now why did I do that? Do you understand what I'm saying? And then you hit yourself and hit yourself and see, and then you hit yourself into self-condemnation. And if you don't hit yourself into self-condemnation, you're going to go to the extreme end of looking at every good thing you have done and you say, oh God, I polish my shoes. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I think this, this, you're going to promote me because I fasted last week. There is nothing you can ever do to be right before God, but there's also nothing you can ever do to be separated from God when you're a believer. Tell somebody it's not by works. It's nothing. I was sharing with somebody who I usually love comparing notes about things. We were studying something in Islam. Interestingly. And so we landed on a certain scripture in the Hadith. I told somebody to put it up for me. Shahi Bukhari. In the volume 8, book 76, Hadith number 470. (laughs) Now, it made me laugh and you're going to enjoy why. The guy said, the prophet, peace be upon him, said, this is Nabi Muhammad. <laughs> now, according to the hadith, so he says, the prophet said, no one of you, listen, will enter paradise by his deeds alone. No one, no one. This is him saying. So they asked him, not even you, O messenger of Allah. And the guy says, eh, not even me, unless God covers me with grace. And even Muhammad, peace be upon him. He reached the same place and said, Now, if I don't have grace here, I want to see it. <laughs> Somebody say, Amen. That thing made me laugh. I said, Wait. Even Muhammad knows that your works can't take you to heaven except by the grace and banangi. Tell somebody, be established in grace. Tell somebody, grow ye in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It killed me to see. Praise the Lord. Like you can't do anything to get God out of you. You cannot also do anything to make God love you more. Be free. Or some people say, now if you say that, people are going to do... No. You see, that fact that you can think that way shows you're not born again. No, no. Listen. The Bible says, to the pure. Have you been purified? To the pure, all things are... They are pure. But to the, the Bible says the unbelieving. He calls them the unbelieving. Everything is defiled. Because they are unbelieving. Praise the Lord Jesus. To the unbelieving, to them that are defiled and unbelieving. Everything is what? 
You know, when a man is born of an incorruptible seed, like you and I, Peter says, we've been born again, not of corruptible, but of the incorruptible seed. When the Bible says you've been born of the incorruptible seed, it means even with the justification through faith, you can't meditate corruption. It's not in you to meditate corruption. Even if you try, you can't. Somebody say amen. Why? Because you're born of the incorruptible. Somebody say, I'm born of the incorruptible. Now, today now in the body of Christ, even though now certain people have understood the justification of faith, some have failed to embrace the place of forgiveness and peace before God, knowing that God forgave you and he holds no record against you. Many people are moving in self-condemnation. I don't think I can ever get married. I did this and that, that. I don't think I can ever be used by God because I did this and that. I don't think God can ever do this in my life because I've been doing this and that. I don't think God... No, 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 listen, listen, listen. Well, let me read it for your scripture. John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. And I want this record to go down. Give me the Amplified. The Amplified says, God did not send his son into the world to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on the world. Jesus was not sent to... Jesus, do you have Jesus? Jesus was not sent to judge you. He was not sent to condemn you. He was not sent to sentence you. The Bible says, but the world might find salvation... And be made safe and sound, the Bible says, through him. And the next verse says, He who believes in him, who clings to trust and relies on him, is not judged. Somebody say, he is not judged. He who trusts in him never comes up for judgment. That means, some people say, now on judgment day. On judgment day, we are not going to talk about sin. We are going to be talking about ministry. But not sin. Somebody say amen. And the Bible says for him, him, there is no rejection, no condemnation. He incurs no damnation. But he who does not believe, the Bible says, cleave or rely on to trust in him, is judged already. For he has already been convicted and has already been received his sentence. Because he has not believed in and trusted in the name of the only begotten Son of God, he is condemned for refusing to let his trust rest in Jesus' name. Anybody who has not believed is already condemned. And anybody who has believed is not under condemnation. Romans 8. He says, for now, give me the Amplified. Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no adjudging, no guilt of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. What does the Spirit say? What does the flesh say? Your flesh says I'm weak. Your flesh says I'm a sinner. Your flesh says I'm this. But what does the Spirit say? The Spirit says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Spirit says that He has set you free from all sin and cleansed you of all disease. That is the working of the Spirit because the Spirit lights the word. Somebody say amen. Say amen again. Stop looking back into your past. Close your... Be free. Some of you, because of your small sins, you reach places and then you start looking guilty. You look, you're not fitting. No, 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 no. Be free. Tell somebody, be free, be free. Yes, you messed up. The Lord forgave you. Move on. Don't do it again, but forgive yourself. And don't let anybody bring you down because of your past weakness. Don't ever let it. Not in this life. Somebody say amen. Don't ever let anyone look at you and make you small but because of your weakness. Romans chapter 8. We are reading something in 8. He says, There is now no condemnation, no judging guilt of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? For the law of the, of the spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus, the law of the new being has freed them from the law of sin and death. Say amen. If you skip to Romans 8, again the 33rd verse in the same chapter, he says that, give me again the Amplified. He says, he who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who? Who? Who shall bring? You see, when you know somebody is called by God, you can't bring any charge on them. That is something I've failed to understand with people. That is why we don't bring charges on men. 
That's why you don't hear us accusing people of things. Because they are... You see... Do you know God is bigger than your heart? The Bible says that if our hearts condemn us, some of you, you must be free in your spirit. The Bible says if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart and He knows all things. He's greater than your heart. He knows all things. And the next verse says, let me first skip there, I'm going to come back to eight. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. We have confidence toward God. Why? Because your heart doesn't condemn you. When I look at myself, I don't see any condemnation on me. Nothing. Even if I search out, does that mean I've not made mistakes? I have made them, but I don't remember them. Even if you remind me, I'll tell you I don't remember. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it says, it shall throw away my sins to the end of the earth, and it shall remember them no more. Now, if you're supposed to imitate Christ, who doesn't remember? Why should you remember? Somebody say amen. And then let's go back to the John. Give me the message version of that. I want you to read something in the message. He says, this is the only way we'll know we're living truly. Living in God's reality. It's the only way. It is also the way to shut down debilitating self-criticism. Even when there is something to eat. For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we do ourselves. You see, some of you, you think you know yourself. No, no, no. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. And he still called you. He never knew you. I wonder how the devil feels. Now, the next verse says, We are able to stretch our hands out and receive what we ask for because we are doing what he said, doing what pleases him. What is that? Again, this is God's command, what he says. To believe in him personally. To believe in his personally named son, Jesus Christ. He also told us to love each other in line with the original commandment. And he says, as we keep his commandments, we live, the Bible says, deeply and surely in what? In him. And he lives in us. And this is how we experience his deep and abiding presence in us by the Spirit. Can you believe there are people who don't enjoy the presence of God because of the guilt conscience, the self-criticism? Oh, sometimes if it's not self-criticism, it's what people say about them. Someone says, you're this, you're that. And then you go in the presence of God and then you remember the words Brother Peter spoke about you. And then you start reminding, oh, th- th- this brother spoke about me. And then you start holding yourself, you know, ransom. And then you carry guilt conscience before God. And the Bible says you hold yourself from the abiding presence of God that is available for you. Because either of what people think about you or what you think about yourself. Banangi, tell your neighbor, be free. He says, for who saw the sun sets free is what? Yeah. Let's continue in Romans. In Romans he says in 33, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? When it is God who justifies. That is, who puts us right in the right relationship with himself. Who shall come forward and accuse, listen, or impeach those whom God has chosen? Will God who acquits us answer me? No. And the Bible says, who is there to condemn us? Will Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who died, or rather who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God actually pleading as in the intercedes for us? God can't do both. He can't accuse you while he is pleading for you. That is why any man who accuses you does not pray for you. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Nobody can pray for you and accuse you at the same time. It's not possible. There is nobody who can say, Me, oh, this this person, he says this, he's that. But anyway, I pray for him. No. No man can accuse and that the tongue, the tongue can't do both. It can't accuse and then seek grace for the man. It's not possible. That is why you notice men of God who like talking about other men of God on the internet where they are always sitting in small corners. Can you believe this guy did this? Those men they don't pray. Those are not praying men. There is one thing I have learned for every man I've met who is really consumed by the spirit of prayer. A praying man does not accuse. No man who really... You know, if you want to prove your prayerlessness, start accusing you know, can you look at that sister? Can you believe what they did? That's not a praying man. A praying man can't wake up and make conferences about another man. Even it has gone so bad that some men stand on the pulpits 
and open a whole sermon on an individual. Then they call other people on the side. Can you believe so and so? And then you also join hate party. Even me, I'm not going to talk to this guy because this guy did this to this guy and then this guy did this. Now, how far is that going to go? And then a man says, I'm a man of God. No, 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 no. No No man of God can set a course of men to hate other men. No, listen. Your place is prayer. Your place is prayer. If you're despised, pray. If you're, you're accused falsely, pray. If they have stolen you, direct translation, do what? The challenge we have with our people is they're religious leaders. They're not men of God. You know there's a difference between a man of God and a religious leader. You understand what I'm saying? It's easy for a religious leader to swallow a narcissist spirit. It's very possible for somebody to be narcissist without even knowing it. We can't breed hatred in the church of Jesus Christ. We know, yes, some people are so immature that they can sit under cheap talk. And some sadly are even judged in the process because they know not what they say. It's absurd that people don't hear God anymore. The Bible says that they hold them back from entering and they themselves don't enter. Some people are destroyed because of how some men of God teach them. How can we walk away from the royal law of love? Royal law of love. Oh, somebody used to pray with you. They used to laugh with you. They loved you with the love of God. The day you joined Fanero, they stopped talking to you. You say, wait a minute. If you can hate a believer for joining another meeting... How, how, how can you tell me you love the lost? Then they also say, next week we have evangelism. <laughs> if you're not good to them which are of the household, how can you tell me that you can feel pain for those which are out without, who have done nothing? Do you understand what I'm saying? Those things have to end. Tell your neighbor, those things have to end. Let me tell you, it's like some of us, somebody one time brought an issue. Oh, this man of God told us you're this. This man of God told us you're that. Then they gave me a whole book, a dictionary, plus three encyclopedias, of what this man of God said about me. And then I, I looked back and I said, now, if even me, I open my dictionary. And then this person goes back and then they start saying, Eh, Munange, when I sat down with Apostle Grace, he told me the truth. The other man is the wrong one. Now, I've put you to a level of exercising yourself in matters that are higher than you, number one. Number two, I've also been consumed by the evil of the other man that I've done exactly what he has done to me. He accused, I also what? Accused, because I think that by accusation it's the only way I can come out of trouble. Ah, uh-uh, ah, uh-uh. I don't need to accuse to come out of trouble. I don't even need to answer an accusation to come out of trouble. I have a God. Tell somebody I have a God. He knows how to fight for you. Tell somebody he knows how to fight for you. One time you can wake up and you're being accused of something you don't even have a clue about. Close your eyes and say, Rako shakatakate. Brakatako yarando zibakate. I assure you, you will stand. You don't need to always, always explain yourself to everybody about how can you believe. And then you even find little Christians also evolving in that talk. Can you believe Gundi told me that Gundi said that? Come. What? No, who told you? So and so. You go to them. You understand? Don't bring me Pastor Zach's issue before you finish it with him. The Bible says if a brother wrongs you, go to them. If you break that principle, don't waste my time coming to me. I'll still ask you, did you talk to Pastor Zach? No. Then I got my phone call. I, I tell you. Pastor Zach, what do you want to Somebody is reporting you here. Yeah, because you see, you are, you are indulging me in ungodly talk. Whether it's right or wrong, talk with Pastor Zach. If he fails, get a second. If he fails, get a third. If he fails, put him before the council. Let them regard him a heretic. But anything outside that, You're the one who knows who is pregnant. You're the one who knows who is not pregnant. You're the one who knows who lied, who goes underwater, who goes on top, who drinks, who... 
You know everybody. You know who what. You know who eats what. You know who go, what, uses eggs. You know who uses what. You know who has a snake. You know who has a cat. You know who has a dog. They look... This is eternal life. That they might know the one true God. And his only son Jesus. That's eternal life. No God. Open scriptures and reveal Jesus. Don't build ministry by spoiling another man. Some people do that. They just, they say, okay, now to build a ministry, I have to make the other guy fall. No. Jesus didn't break men for him to stand. He simply revealed the Father. Simply reveal the Father. Simply reveal the Father. You see, I've, I've said it. After here, a, a person can put somebody in the parking and start talking about another sister. <laughs> Somebody say, Gobagamba Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say, Amen. So when somebody brings me and he's, Oh, this brother did this. Ah, okay, so did you talk to them? Yeah, I talked to them. And what did they say? ABC, you failed? Yes. So you're involving me as a, as a second person? Yeah, let's go together. No, don't tell them, Apostle. Why don't we tell them? Because they will think that I, I spoke behind, did, haven't you done it? Apostle, you don't understand. Understand what? Because I don't want to be wrong in principle. And then think I'm right in conviction. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are stewards of mystery. If we were to open our mouths to tell you what everyone does. Even When I look there, I know somebody who did something funny. When I look there, I know someone who did something funny. Now, even me, I start in a conversation. Can you believe that sister? Really? There's a story I heard that hurt me to the bone. A young girl walked into an office of a man of God. And she confided in him that she was suffering from a, a certain STD. And uh, she needs prayers. And then he prayed for her. And then the young girl goes out of that office. And then the man of God has somebody coming into the office. And then the man of God calls this person who has come in. Hey, first run and see that girl who is disappearing with a purple top. Then the person ran. So the person with the purple top. So the face came back. Uh-huh. What were you saying, pastor? Can you believe that person told me she has an issue? And those are men who have titles in the church. I'm a pastor. You're a pastor? You are a pastor? If a person can't trust you, if a person cannot, as a man of God, if a person can't trust you with his weakness, God has no business dealing with his strength on you. He has no business. Because his strength is made perfect in weakness. Somebody say amen. Those are the things that make us men of God. You must be a steward. You must keep these things and pray for individuals until they come out. Oh, common sense. It's not common. Somebody say amen. Now in Romans he says, who shall lay any charge against God's elect? Is it God who justifies them? Who shall come forward and accuse or impeach those whom God has chosen? Will God who acquits us? And the next verse says, who is there to condemn us? Will Christ Jesus the Messiah, who died or rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God actually pleading as he intercedes for us? Can he intercede for you and charge you? No. And the Bible says, who shall ever separate us from Christ's love. Who? Give me the message version. Let's go back a bit to the, to the message version. I need to read it. Who dare tangle with God by messing with one who God has chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger to the one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at the very moment speaking up for us. And the Bible says, do you think anyone is going to be able, listen, to drive a wedge between you and Christ's love. He says there is no way, no trouble, no hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing. Are you hearing me? Not even the worst sin listed in scripture. You say it all you want, you'll still be a woman of God. Say it all you want, you'll still be a man of God. Because God did not call her on your terms. Tell somebody, mind your own business. The Bible has said, even the worst sin in scripture, 
If somebody has an issue, leave them with God. Leave them with God. Because God knows where they are, how they are going to be, how they will move, whatever pertains to their life, just leave them with God. Leave them with God. Let God order and provide. Let God restore. Let God judge. Let him condemn. Let him do every, anything. But leave men with their God. Somebody say amen. Next verse. Let's read. Uh-huh. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We are sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. And the Bible says, none of this faces us because Jesus loves us. And Paul says, I am absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing, living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way Jesus has embraced us. The way, the way, the way, the way. He didn't love us the way you love us. No. He did not love her the way you love her. No, no, no. He has, God, Jesus has a certain way. Tell your neighbor, he loves a certain way. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ. Nothing. Nothing. Not even the worst sin in scripture. That is why I wonder when somebody sets themselves against another Christian. For what? You're probably also going to fall under the same issue. Someday or even worse. Because for you it will be another kind of thing. You understand what I'm saying? But how sweet to know the way Jesus loves us. That's why some people don't understand when we are crazy. It is the way he loves us. It's the way. You remember the man who sang? Of the mountains and the sea. Your river runs with love for me. Uh-huh. Will open up a heart and feel a set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. Uh-huh. For I will I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. Then in a slow song you remembered, Oh, I feel like dancing. <laughs> He says, oh, I feel like that. That just came. He did. <laughs> Woo! Tell somebody the devil is a liar. It's because of the way, G- you know, there are people here. It, when they look back at what they did and the things they have done and the life they have lived, When they look at their lives and look back on their story and there is nothing God holds them for, there is no reason why they can't run mad. Because if you were raised in a Christian family where you used to pray every day, where you used to tuck in and wash your shoes in the evening and put baby tail on your face every evening, you were a good boy through school, you graduated well, you didn't do anything wrong, and then you got a job, and then you entered Fanero, you might not understand. When they, oh my goodness. And the Lord extended love. The Lord extended love. How many of you look back at your life and say, but if it wasn't for God? (laughs) Put up your hand. And say, for me, if it wasn't for God. Do I have a witness? Some of you, they used to pick you in bars, literally. You don't even know your way back home. But now you're raising your holy hands. You don't even remember... Some of you, you even got 
a point where you used to look like a foreigner in your father's house. You appear once. The rest of the days, you're out crazy. You had every ticket to every, every show in Kampala. Sponsored by every kind of drink. And now you're here in the Holy Ghost. Humble to be loved by God. Free of charge. So, when you shout, when, <laughs> a young lady came in my office and told me, this I'm saying because she even promised to give a testimony one day. She told me, since she was 12, she cannot count the number of men she has slept with. Because they are not 20, they are not 30, she was telling me, they are not 50, they are not 60, they are not 70, they are not 80. I can't count them. They are not 90. Apostle, they are not 100. I'm sure they are more. Since the age of 12, and then she lost self-worth, and then she was at the verge of committing suicide, she is involved in a form of witchcraft high end. At night a spirit in the shape of a man would come and turn into a snake and use her every night. When a man came to her and told her I want to marry you, she told him I can't love. I don't, have, I don't even understand what it means. I don't know the difference anymore between love and what you're telling me. And that woman sentenced herself in her spirit and in you if a man never comes, if I never have children, if I, it will be okay. Because I've messed up so bad. So bad. This same lady comes to my office. Tells me for now three years, she has not slept with a man. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And she tells me an apostle, and I'm happy. Because when I look at my past, I am free. And I say, this is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. Ero yali asobola chisoi. Yali asobola teka. Ato yali asobola kufumbirwa wa teka. That one can't marry a man under the law because he will go back and say, wait a minute. Let us open the scriptures. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how bad you have been. There is a blood that washes away all sin. And I mean all. And the Lord remembers it no more. That is the gospel we preach. Tell your neighbor that is the gospel we preach. And if we have to pay price for it, we don't give a damn. Let them speak. But as long as those doors are open for people like that, People who can come in Fanero and feel like they are home. They might not have been the worst. But when they come here, they feel they find answers. They feel they have a reason to live again. Stop condemning yourself. Tell your neighbor, stop condemning yourself. The Lord forgave you. Forgive yourself also. In the name of Jesus. Raise your hands and worship God. Stop condemning yourself. Stop condemning yourself. Stop condemning yourself. Somebody speak in other tongues. Stop condemning yourself. Who saw the sun set free is free indeed. Do not allow to be condemned by men. Do not allow to be condemned by the opinions of people. Do not allow to be condemned by people who don't understand God's forgiveness and mercy. Yes, you messed up, but the Lord forgave you. Do not let the devil hold you hostage of your past mistakes. Move on. Move on. In the name of Jesus. Of your love forever. 
I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. I can sing all your love forever. 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 I can sing all your love. Forever, I could sing all your love. Forever, I could sing all your love. Forever, address the devil this evening. Tell him I refuse to be accused. I carry no guilty stain. The blood of Jesus has washed me white as snow. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God, sanctified, set apart, imputed righteousness on, and there is nothing in the world you can do. I am more than a conqueror by Christ which strengthens me. The Lord has had mercy and grace over my life. I am not made free by works. I'm not justified by works, but by faith. Refuse to be a victim of self-condemnation in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want you to give the Lord a mighty God for praise. Some devils go without addressing them. <laughs> Somebody say amen. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ and you want to receive Jesus to as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to come right now and receive Him as your Lord and Savior. There is no day as beautiful as today. Come and stand here. And receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I can sing of your love. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. Come on, check your neighbor. If they're not born again, encourage them to come. I feel there are more people. Repeat this one after me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Repeat this one after me. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I receive you. I believe that you are.
you're the only true son of God who gave this life for me. I believe you did not come to judge me. You did not come to condemn me. You came to love me. So tonight, I receive you in my heart as my Lord and Savior. Tonight, I become a new creature. In Jesus' name. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest. Thank you.